you like to say what this is? Just. Well, this is a picture of Gloria Christian when she was with the uh, Jersey. The Jersey Jolters in the roller derby. Okay. In the roller Great. derby. Great. Uh, this is uh, Randy handling Josh and uh, taking first place at a dog show, and he was champion. One is Josiah. All right. To the traveling baseball team I played on, uh, the Linden Arians. Uh, from Linden, New Jersey, who traveled all over and were state champions the year I played with them. Where are you? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay, today my name is Phyllis Zwarich, and today is February 10th, 2004, and this tape is a series of interviews of North Fork Women for the Archives Committee of the North Fork Women for Women Fund. Uh, we are here today with Gloria Christian Hello. on the right and Randy Gano. 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 Ruth Randy Gano. Oh, 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 you're touching <laughs> dangerous territory. <laughs> okay. Uh, today Lucy Steele is on the camera and we're going to talk to Randy and Gloria about how they wound up on Shelter Island and how they they began life, where they were raised, where they they grew up and some of the stories of, of their life stories. So, um, first of all, how long are you here on Shelter Island? Uh, we'll be here 10 years in June. Okay, so that's 1994 that 94. you moved here. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, before that, where, where were you born and raised, Gloria? I was born in Brooklyn, uh, and raised in Brooklyn until the age of about 11 and a half, and then moved to New Jersey. Where in New Jersey? Uh, into Clark, Roy and Clark, New Jersey, both which two is, little towns that are side by side. Which is where? What, what part of Jersey? Uh, that's in the central part of the Central state. part, okay. Mm -hmm. And Randy, where were you born and raised? Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania. And your family was there for a long time or they had moved there? No, they, they were there for a long, long time. Uh-huh. And how did you wind up in Jersey? You eventually wound up in New Jersey. Uh, where did you go to high school? Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania. Jersey Shore. And then after that, where did you first start working? In uh, Williamsport. Is that when I know Williamsport, you Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I know you became a very good photographer. Was that something that you did right out of high school, or was that something that you did later on? Uh, pretty much out of high school. You well, worked you went, for another... You went to, uh, to school in New York for yeah. a period of time to photography school, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Phyllis school was talking about, yeah. photography. Oh, okay. And then after that, you went to work back in Pennsylvania with yes. a photographer studio? Uh, Stern's department store. Uh-huh. Studio. And then from there, I went with my boss to her own studio. But she... We opened a studio of our own. In Jersey Shore or no, Williamsport? Williamsport. Williamsport. Mm -hmm. And you were there for how many years with her? Oh boy. A few. Quite a few. Quite a few. Mm -hmm. Was it when you left there, was that when you moved to Jersey? To New Jersey? Uh yeah. Gloria, how did what you had mentioned that you were in high school and played softball in New Jersey? Um, that's one of the pictures we have of you of the softball team. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a, a traveling team that uh, I had heard about, and I loved playing softball. Uh, I had graduated high school already, uh, and I joined the uh, the Arians and played with them, uh, played second base with them. This was a team that uh, was formed by a woman called Toots Nussie, who was famous as a pitcher. Uh -huh. And uh, she started this uh, girls' women's league. Matter of fact, she ran it until she was almost 65 or 70 years of age. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, she's passed away now. But it was a very, uh, very active league. And Just in New Jersey? or was No, it we also like played uh, against the uh, girls in New York. Uh, we played in uh, Pennsylvania, but uh, New Jersey was mostly where our games were. Uh -huh. uh, we used to play uh, 
the weekends and would be on the road. Yeah, were you still in high school when you were on this team, or were you? No, at, I was already out of high school. You were already out of high school. Mm -hmm. I graduated high school at 16, so I was already out. Uh, and uh, it was it was an interesting interesting time, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I used to have some fun weekends. Uh, I also, at that point in my life, uh, was riding a motorcycle <laughs> and uh, taking flying lessons. So when we had games on Sundays, we found it a little difficult sometimes for me to meet the team when I was supposed to. So if I were late getting there, I would miss the teams leaving on a Saturday morning. I would have to get somebody to take me up on a motorcycle in order to make it in time. <laughs> uh, a couple of times I was on the field before the rest of the team was because of traffic, but uh, it was a lot of fun. It was interesting. Made a lot of friends. And then from there, you, you wound up going into the uh, roller derby. That's How did right. that transition take place? Uh, well, we would go out and have beers after ball games, which I think is typical of all ball players. And at that point, the roller derby was very popular. It was on two or three nights a week. And we were sitting in a bar one night having beer and hot dogs and stuff. And it came on the screen. We were sitting watching it like everybody did. I mean, it was the height of the popularity of the roller derby back in 47. And uh, I have a big mouth, so I said that, boy, I'd like to do that. That looks like fun. And I think I'd like to try out for that. And of course, all my friends started to laugh and said, what are you, you kidding me? pull it over? Okay. Uh, what are you kidding me? And you don't even, you don't even, uh, you don't even have, you haven't even been to a roller skating rink. And I said, no, but uh, I'd like to go. Well, it ended up with a $100 bet that I would go to the uh, tryouts. And if I could make a team, with, I would win $100. So I bet them $100. I didn't own a pair of the rink skates. I had only been in a rink four, four, maybe four times in my life. But as a kid in Brooklyn, I skated in the streets. Yeah. So I, you know, hung on the back of the trucks, going down the street, having fun. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I decided that I was going to go try out. And I had had a job in this uh, plastic factory because I couldn't get a job at 16. You know, very yeah, difficult to yeah. get a job. So uh, I had the job in the plastic factory. I took a couple of days off and I went into New York. I think if I remember right, and this you're going to have to hold me to, I think it was the 14th Street Army. It was either 14th or 69th Street Army. Yeah, in, the, in the city, in Manhattan. In the city. Not in Brooklyn, but in Manhattan. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I went to the tryouts, and they were having a number of uh, people there, and they could get up on the track and uh, skate around with a pack of girls, wow. which I did. And they called me over and they said, uh, you've been picked up as an alternate. And I said, okay. I said, what does that mean? They said, well, you have to move into the hotel uh, on Monday. And this was like Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday of the prior week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I moved into the hotel. Uh, I had mom and dad had taken me. But I had to have a signature because I wasn't 18 yet. Now, why did they have you moving into the hotel? This was so to keep everybody together. Oh, you lived. You lived together. Oh, you lived together. Oh, oh yeah. You okay. didn't just go and skate at night. You lived together. So wow. uh, I moved into the hotel. Uh, or no, we went to the. I went to the track. That's what it was. I reported to the track, and I had my mom and dad with me. They had the baggage, and my father had to sign papers for me to get to skate because I wasn't old enough. And mom and dad decided to wait and watch it. They wanted to see what it was all about. And we had got up on the track and we had a practice run. And Monogene Payne and Carl Payne, Monogene was the captain of the Jersey Jolters at the time and Carl was the coach. And they called me over and they introduced me to Monogene and Carl and they said, they've picked you up for the Jersey Jolters as of today. And I said, fine. And uh, I said, what does that mean? <laughs> you know. I mean, I knew nothing about it. I, I was just, I was having a lark, which I was known for, you know, pulling stunts. So I 
went over to my mom and dad and I says, well, now they want me to move back to New Jersey to the Newark Hotel. And I said, but they don't want me to there until Monday. I said, I'm coming home with you. The hell with this. So back <laughs> home I went. And I went up to the bar that night and I wanted my hundred dollars. And nobody would give it to me because they didn't believe it. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> so okay, Monday, went into the Newark Hotel and I floated it to the track. They gave me a uniform. In the meantime, I had to buy the skates that I had borrowed from the girl I had borrowed, bought them from, mm -hmm. uh, borrowed them from. So I moved into the hotel and uh, got my uniform, practiced that morning, and was on television skating that night. Was this the uniform Damn. that? Hmm? Was this the uniform that they gave you? Yes, that, that was a that was a, a uh, out of town uniform. We had show this. we had the striped uniforms were out of town. And we had solid colors with orange and white huh? for in town. Let's do the back when we were playing. When we were playing uh, home team. <laughs> That's great. But, and how uh, much did you weigh when you wore that? I weighed at the most 110 pounds. <laughs> I was five four at that point, but I weighed about 100. Well, no, maybe five three. I weighed about 110 pounds. And uh, I started skating that night. They were on TV. In, in they were on TV, TV three nights, yeah. four nights a week. Yeah. What was the point we of the roller derby? The point of the, the roller derby? Of the game itself. Of the, what was the goal? What was the, to, to outlast everybody? No, I, never really I guess understood. you could say the goal was, like every other game, winning. Yeah, but I mean, how did you win? How did you win? By scoring points, by passing the other opponent. Passing. Okay. Passing the opposing team. Okay. Uh, players. So every time you went uh, by. So. I can give you a little bit of a tutorial on it if you'd like. Uh, there were about eight or ten of us gals on the team, equal number of guys, depending on who was hurt or who was sick. Usually it was about eight of us at night. Uh, we um, had four quarters like a basketball game mm -hmm. or a football game. How and much was, time each quarter? Each quarter was about 15 minutes of actual skating time. Now this took about a half hour or more because it was actual skating time, 15 mm -hmm. minutes. And what you did is you had what they called uh, a pack. Now that would be five girls out on the track at one given time, racing around the track at about 30 miles, 35 miles an hour. Uh, and the idea was that you would try to get your team member out in front, go around the track, come up behind because now your other team members are holding the pack back for you to come behind and pass opposing skaters to get points. And for okay. one skater, you get one point. If you got yeah. past the whole pack, you got five points, or three, three points, I guess it was, three points. Oh, yes. Remember, I'm, you know, 50 years ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Try to remember no, no. everything. Yeah. I just didn't really ever understand. Yeah. So down around the pack you would go uh, and try to pass as many members of the opposing team. And... Uh, <laughs> The fellas oh, would skate one quarter first, then the girls would skate a quarter. And you'd get whacked around quite a bit. Oh, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Uh, that, were you ever, you're many? going at a speed on uh, wooden wheels. Uh, if you, mm -hmm. somebody breaks a wheel and goes down and you pile up on top of them, you can get hurt. <laughs> or if somebody hits you and you don't expect it. Yeah. Did you ever get hurt? Oh, yeah. I got hurt twice. The first time I got hurt was a girl broke a wheel in front of me. And she went down. And I yelled to her to stay down, and she didn't hear me. And I jumped her, or tried to. And she came up and caught my skates with the back of her head and flipped me. I did a triple somersault and landed on my spine. Ouch. Yeah. I uh, ended up on crutches for three weeks that time. Uh, the time that finished me, as far as skating, was uh, a couple years later in Boston. Uh, one of my best friends on the Brooklyn Red Devils hit me without, I didn't hear her. She singled me. She was going to hit me. She was six foot two. Mm. And the idea was that she was picking on me all night. And that, of course, the fans loved, you know, for me to get back at her. And I had gotten back at her a couple times, and she was still picking on me. And uh, she banged the, the deck to tell me she was going to quit me. And I didn't feel it, and I didn't hear it, because the crowd was screaming, so... And it, uh, she picked me up and threw me into the upright. Wanted yeah. to do that? Pick huh? people up? 
well, not physically picked me up. She got under me and hit me okay. and okay. threw me into the upright. Okay. And at that point, they didn't have padding on the uprights. It was oh. just a two by four, doubled, you know, like a four by four. So uh, after that, they padded the uprights. But I ended up in Boston General <laughs> with a broken collarbone, an inch of away from my neck, and torn nerves in my right arm. Mm. And that ended my skating career. They told me if I used the loose, if I injured my right shoulder again and my right collarbone again, I would lose the use of my right arm. Mm. <laughs> and I said it wasn't worth it. Yeah. That was when you were talking that you were in a cast for a long time. Oh, too. I was in a half body cast for six, six and a half months. Yeah. yeah. Kind of cute and stood up like this from here to here. <laughs> It was fun. So then once that was over, where, where, what did you do next? Trying to find a job you can work with when you have no use of your right arm. Yeah, <laughs> 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 you know, sort of one of those interesting times in your life. How old right were you then? Uh, I guess almost 20 and a half, somewhere around there. Somewhere in that area. Uh, so I came home and my mother had just had my little brother. And she had me and a body cast and a baby in the house. And I couldn't get out of bed by myself. <laughs> so poor my poor mom, she'd come in and she'd plunk my brother down on my cast and say, you watch him while I go do something. And then she'd come in and get both of us up. You know. but, uh, then I tried to find a job. And then I found a job. Uh, well, at that point, by the time I found a job, I was out of the cast and into a sling. And I found a job, job driving one of these little trucks that you go house to house selling things, mm -hmm. like yeah. coffee, tea, yeah, and you give premiums away. Mm -hmm. Well, I did that for about uh, seven that, or eight months. How did you manage to do that if your arm was in a? Well, I did. I had a problem. I the first two weeks or so, you were with a supervisor, and you had to uh, have him with you in the truck. To show you the route. Yeah. And I couldn't tell him I was in a sling, so I had to take the sling off and drive left handed and cart everything left handed and try to make excuse, you know, oh gee, I must pull my arm or something, you know, um, until I would get rid of her. And then I put the sling back on and continued on the job. Oh. But I uh, did that for a while. <laughs> and uh, went from there to. Uh, so what did I do next? Oh, I went to work in another factory. I went uh, up to John's Mandel and worked as a weaver in one of these big looms, thousand thread looms, uh, for firefighter suits on the night shift. And I uh, rented a little farmhouse with a lovely little elderly couple. Remember, they were so short, when he drove his big Buick, he couldn't see over the steering wheel, so he used to look through it. <laughs> Cute little man, and she was a love. And, and, they, she, fa and they farmed this? They this? farmed. It was a peach, peach and truck farm. And I rented the cottage on the peach and truck farm. And uh, she taught me how to camp out in the open, you know, in a big old fireplace. The bricks and the stone. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Well, I had a grand time canning. Wow. So I canned during the day and go to work at night, you know. Uh, and did that. What kind of vegetables and, and things did Asparagus, they Asparagus, and they had. Uh, oh, the biggest crop was the peaches. The peaches. Oh, yeah. But they had the tomatoes, uh, pickles, for the, uh, cucumbers for pickles. So she taught me to make pickled you know, mm -hmm. pickles and uh, pickled cucumbers. Uh, she taught me to can tomatoes. So that means you had those big cauldrons with where big they had all the mason up on this big in. stone fireplace out in oh. the backyard. And that was the way you did it. Oh, that's hard work. <laughs> and uh, I did that for, I guess, 20, 21 maybe to 23, 23 and a half. And then I collapsed with pernicious anemia, <laughs> the plant one night. So they put me on... Uh, you know, those days it wasn't the protections for the young people have today. Yeah, the medicine. And everything. You didn't have a lot of coverage. You didn't have a lot of things uh, for protection. So they were good to me. They, mm -hmm. for the time, for the era, uh, they put me on, on uh, layoff. 
So I think you're talking about the health the insurance plans. They didn't that was no. That, that was the health. No, there was no. There was no health. There was no health insurance. Yeah. Uh, they put me on uh, layoff so that I could collect unemployment. Hmm. And then I traveled around for a while. And how did you wind up in the uh, the uh, uh, assessing? Was it assessing? It was, no, appraising. Appraising. Oh, let's see. Uh, after I got back on my feet, I went back to where I had worked when I was 15 years of age, and that was running in a very large ice cream parlor. It was the only one we had in town. What had. town was that in? Clark. Clark. Mm -hmm. And I went back to work there, and I did it for about a month, and got up one morning and I couldn't, couldn't walk. The injury had come back from my back. And uh, I went, finally, after going to doctor to doctor, I found a chiropractor who helped me. By the time I went to him, I was crawling on my hands and knees. Mm. I couldn't stand up and couldn't walk. So uh, what I had was a severe sciatica condition, injury. So he told me point blank, you can't take a job standing. He yeah. said, so you better just think about something else in your life. So I decided maybe at this point, I was almost 24, I better grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to work for a real estate firm, a little uh, small town firm. And I worked there for a few months, and I wanted to get into something where I could, this was run by an elderly couple. And at that time, there were very few women in real estate. Mm -hmm. And we're talking back 1954. Yeah. So um, there was a firm that I wanted to get to work for. It was run by two fellas, and it was pretty active. So I went and talked to them and asked them for a job, and they told me they didn't have any women in their office. And I said, well, what about me? You know, and they said, well, I don't know. We'll give you a 30-day trial. If you can learn to get along with the guys and not aggravate them, and uh, we'll let you stay. So I've learned how to cuss and play poker. <laughs> I really knew how to play poker. I'm teasing. And I learned how to play gin rummy, really. Uh, but uh, and that's what I started with. I was for how, hard, how hard was it when you went to deal with customers? Did they give you a hard time too? I mean, it was, as a woman dealing with customers, did uh, they you presume get you were the secretary? From some men, uh -huh. you know, but not, not not really. Usually, the women, uh, when it comes to a house, the men stay uh, whatever she wants, you know, more or less attitude. Oh, so the so you did deal with the women. So then, I did with the women. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, and that's when I started in real estate. And having, uh, how can I put this? having a rebel personality and being stubborn and wanting to do what I wanted to do, and I guess because I always believed that I could do it, uh, I started going into other areas. So I not only sold real estate, but I went to insurance school and got my insurance licenses. I did health and casualty insurance. Uh, and went and got my broker's license. And instead of being a salesperson, mm -hmm. I was associate broker at the firm. Mm -hmm. And then I started taking an interest in uh, appraising, only because we had appraisers that would come to the office uh, from the banks, or from the veterans. The veterans were very popular at that time. Everybody was buying under VA or FHA loans and they all required an appraisal of the property. And they would come and ask for the keys or ask to be shown the property, and I'd be talking to them, and I could never figure out what they were doing. And I had this terrible, insatiable <laughs> thirst for knowledge, and I had to know. So I, thought, I took a course, and I was the only woman in the class. And I took another course at Rutgers University. And the t instructor there, said to me, why aren't you going on with this? You have the insight into it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of cute. He was a very, very gentlemanly, old school type fella. And every night we would have class, and every night he would come in and it would be hot or something. He would say to me, Miss Christian, may I take off my coat, please? 
You know, this was, this was a different era. This is the era I wish we had back when I see some of the trash going on today. And I would say, yes, of course, and he would say, damn, or something when he was lecturing, and oh, I'm so sorry, and that's it. That's all right. I know the word, you know. And uh, he would, uh, he was a real, real gallant gentleman. And he said, I'd like to see you go on. And I said, oh, I'm doing real estate, I'm doing well. I run the insurance. I, I don't need any more. I, I just want to know how to beat these guys at their own game, you know. He said, I really wish you would go on. You, would you think about it? So I said, all right, I'll think about it. Well, then I got bored. And when I got bored, I always got in trouble. So I decided <laughs> maybe I'd better go on. So he had me apply to the Appraisal Institute, which was a national organization in which he was a member, and to become a candidate. And they had never had a candidate, a woman candidate in the state of New Jersey. I think there were only 13 in the whole country that had their designations from this organization. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I don't know how this is going to go. And he said, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk to the board and see whether they'll consider it, he said, before you apply. So I said, fine. And I went and came back to the next week and he said to me, we want you to apply. So I applied, and a couple of months later, I get a telegram telling me to report to the downtown club in Newark to the uh, to the monthly meeting. And dressed in my best bib and tucker, off I go to the downtown club and get into the elevator up to the tenth floor where the meeting was being held, and step out of the elevator and stop by the maitre d'. You're not allowed in here, ma'am. This is a men's club. <laughs> well, I said, I've got a problem. I got a telegram in my hand that says I have to be here. And I'm not leaving until you go in there and get somebody to talk to me. And the president came out after he went, did you stay right here? And I said, I'll stay right here. And he went in and got the president of the chapter. And he came out. And he apologized to me for the inconvenience. They forgot to tell the maitre d' that there was a woman now going to be in the organization. And they invited, invited me into the, they used to have this little side room that was a tap room. And I said, you know what? I said, I really don't think I should push my way in here. I said, let's make this a little easier on everybody, me included. I'll sit out here in this, there was like a lobby right outside of it with these big, nice, soft chairs. I said, I'll sit out here. And uh, when I, we go in for dinner, you know, I'll go in for dinner with everybody. So I sat there for about a year and a half before I ever went into the tap room until I got to know the fellas. And I had a real cute elderly waiter who used to come out. As soon as he saw me, he would bring me my drink and he would serve it to me out there on a little table. And then finally, another woman came into the organization. She was the wife of one of the officers and she had gotten accepted as a candidate. And uh, she was an older woman. I'm, I was, this was 1962, so I was only 32, which was young for this type of a woman. Mm -hmm. And she came in and she said, what are you sitting out here for? And I said, because I said, I don't like pushing her. You know, I get along great with them. Leave me alone, let them, you know, leave them alone. She said, the hell with that. Come on, we're going in. And she dropped the ice. But of course, her husband was sitting in there. You know. yeah. And that was how it uh, how it got started. And by the time I left, I think we had about eight women. Uh, but I worked and got my designation with that organization, and uh, I was also designated with a second organization, an appraisal organization, a smaller one. Mm -hmm. And the smaller one, I was um, in 1971, the first woman president they had ever had of a chapter. And I had some fun because that was the day of the feminists burning their bras. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love those girls for that. More trouble. <laughs> I'd have guys sitting there at dinner, and I'd be trying to run the program, and I'd have them say, Hey, Gloria, when are you going to burn your bra? <laughs> Especially one guy, Harry. He drove me crazy. Finally, I had enough of him all night. I told him what he could do in a very nice way. I told him I was going to burn my bra and everything else because I was superior to men. And as long as I was where I was, and he was sitting out there, 
if he had didn't keep his mouth shut, I was going to throw him out. <laughs> I mean, one of those things, you know. But that was it. Yeah, was, yeah. How did the two of you meet? You've been together how long now? Oh, too long. <laughs> See, that's the reaction you get from Randy all the time. 33 years we've been together. It'll be 34 this April. So how old were you when you met Randy? Well, I met Randy. I was 25. But, oh, but we didn't, didn't like each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> we just stand the sight of each other. And you met each other at uh, social gathering from somebody. And there were no bars or, or places that oh, you could go yeah, to, but, or were there? Uh, I don't. Really, I wasn't going to bars at that point, and I don't think you ever went to them, did you? Much. You yeah. hung out with the fellas mostly, the gay men. <laughs> yeah. Her friend, best friends were all the gay men, and I was busy. I was going to school and trying to study and. But now she's living in New Jersey when you yeah, met, correct? Yeah. We met at 25, I was 25, she was 30, uh -huh. in New Jersey. And just didn't like each other at all. <laughs> and we would see each other on occasion. But so. mm -hmm. And then now, what we was... re met at 40. I was 40. Okay. And then and she was 45. Then you then you. And we had both grown up. <laughs> <laughs> now, when were you doing the uh, the, the dog, showing of the dogs when you had that experience? Was that was before, before you me. met? Oh, that was before. And and during. And during. Can you talk a little bit about that when you started doing that? You started in Pennsylvania with with the woman that you knew there, or did you wait? Were you doing it in Jersey? Uh, no, I. Uh, well, you went to dog shows with Marnie, Marnie in Pennsylvania and in yeah, Florida and traveled yeah. with her, with her uh, shepherds. German, uh, German shepherds. Me with the German shepherds. Yeah. The, yes. Margaret McGann. Okay. And uh, she would, she took me down to Florida. To, she was taking her dog down to Florida to showing. And I went with her. And I stayed over at her house at night because she said, I don't think you'll get here in time to leave in the morning. Well, she knew you. You <laughs> never got anywhere on time. <laughs> so you better stay over tonight. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she showed German Shepherds. Yes. And she taught you how to show them and, and work with them? Well, I didn't show Shepherds, but I did show Dachshunds. Oh, okay. That's that's the picture with the dachshund. Mm -hmm. That was your dog. Yes. So you owned the dog and showed it. Right. Interesting. Randy doesn't talk too much about herself, so I'm going to talk for her a little bit. When she was showing Josh, he was not only a bench champion, but she took him through obedience training, and he was the highest pointed dachshund in obedience that they had ever had. So she had mm -hmm. a very good uh, training program with field Josh. Trials. Well, you also took him to field trials. Really? That was and then really we fun. went on, when we had dachshunds together, Randy showed uh, Thomas, or he was out with Thomas a while time, who was a champion of 10 months. Ooh. And she showed him, and she showed his mother, Britches, uh, who was wild time of solo. And uh, Britches was a little bit too heavy. She. Besides that, she didn't like it much. She thought it was more fun to lay on the couch and sleep than to a dog show. But Thomas well, loved it. Which dog shows did you work? Oh, God, all Ooh. over. It was That's kind of a Indian, circus. New Jersey, New York. Uh, Long Island, for the show. Yeah, Long Island. And Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas, when he won, he won the biggest five-point major at the Daly Show here on Long Island. Uh-huh. It was when he finished you, his champion. How do you know where the shows are? Do, it's an organization that you oh, belong to? Oh, well, there's yeah. all kinds of them. The AKC can tell you, or the uh, we belong to the Dachshund Club of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also did, with the Dachshund Club of New Jersey, Randy was a judge for the uh, field trial. Uh -huh. Really? Uh -huh. Field trials must have been fun. Yeah, uh, that, that is a great time. Uh, and I used to do the secretary because she wouldn't do the paperwork. <laughs> she said, the heck with this. She liked the outside work, but she wasn't going to do the paperwork. Uh, but we, our, our life was a bit hectic there for a while. Uh -huh. You know, you'd come home from work Friday night, you'd load the car up with four dogs, four crates, all the blankets, all the, the food and everything else, and take off for God knows where for the weekend. All the grooming supplies. Yeah, and get home Sunday night, and if you were at a field trial, you came home with wet 
uh, towels mm. and wet blankets mm. and wet dogs mm -hmm. and four dogs trying to get them in the mm -hmm. bathtub mm -hmm. all at once, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and get yourself ready to go to work Monday morning. So. Wow. Now, yeah. what kind of dachshunds were those for? They we were had wire-haired dachshunds. Wire-haired. They were all wire-haired. Yeah. If you want to shoot, there's a picture of them up there. Well, if we can get up there, I don't know, but uh, that was our wire-haired dachshunds. I see. Here they are. Yeah. A lot of fun, a lot of work. And how long did you do that? That was a lot of years? Maybe oh, four. Yeah, yeah at least. Probably. At least four, four or five, five years. years. Almost every weekend somewhere. Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, that is hard work. Yeah. Then, th th so that, that you were both working at the time, mm -hmm. and then... This had to be, what, in the 80s by this time? No, this was in the late 70s. Late 70s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you I started. I started mm -hmm. my firm. I had worked for other people uh, for a number of years. I managed offices. I think the largest one I managed was 18 salespeople. Uh, and I ran the insurance department. And I did the appraisal for the firm. And then when I got my designation in 68, I uh, opened my own firm. What was the name of your firm? Uh, Gloria L. Christian Appraisals. Uh huh. Yeah. Sole, sole operator. I didn't incorporate. And uh, Randy and I got together in '70, so I, my firm was fairly, fairly new at the time. And you were living in a house at that time, or an apartment? Uh, yeah. At that point, well, we lived in an apartment for one year, and then mm. we bought the house. And. Uh, at that point, I was uh, pretty much switching out. I had sold the insurance business off because I, I just got tired of the, the shenanigans with the insurance. You know, somebody would fall down and somebody's walk, walking in front of their house because they're klutzy oh. and then sue because they yeah. fell down in front of their house. <laughs> and then the, I think the one that topped it off one day that really finished me was... The woman wanted to not only sue for herself, but she wanted to sue for her husband because he lost her services. <laughs> I think that that was the one that, that finally finished me. And I was still selling real estate. And I can tell you a cute story about why I let, stopped selling, too. Uh, I was out one day with the woman with her little boy showing a house. And uh, she had a lady friend or somebody with her. And, we were talking about the house, and I turned around and looked, and here's the kid peeing in the corner of the house in the living room in the rug. <laughs> and I went bonkers. <laughs> and I said to her, do you re realize what your son just did? And she's, oh, he's done that before. <laughs> and oh I God. said, geez, what? I said, uh, would you mind getting in the car? We're going back to the office. I had to get somebody to come clean the whole house for the woman. I mean, I had to get people in immediately before I could tell this poor woman that her kid peed in the corner of her living yeah, room. <laughs> and I took her back to the office and she said, I don't know what you're upset about. And I said, I'll tell you how upset I am by this. I said, please don't bother coming back to this firm because we will not service you. We will not take you out to look at another house. And yeah. I had had it. I mean, between that and kids, oh, kicking, kids kicking you in the back of the head while you're driving yes. and their mother's saying, oh, isn't he cute? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I pretty much then had... Really, I, I think it was a slow transition, but I had made up my mind that I was more interested in the appraisal end of yeah. the business. It was more uh, challenging mentally. It was more difficult, and uh, I found it more enjoyable. So then I went on to pretty much doing nothing but appraising for the last rest of my career. And, and then I, I know you, your aunt owned this house a bit originally, so can you tell a little bit about how you wound up coming here from Well, Jersey? actually, we came in 94, but I bought the house from my aunt in 85. Uh, she was elderly. As a matter of fact, she lived, uh, well, she was about 77 at the time we bought the house. Mm -hmm. She lived to be 88. Uh, but uh, she was having a difficult time financially. My uncle had died fairly young, and she was alone here, and she had a very small pension. So what I did is I had her call in her family attorney, and we worked out an arrangement that I bought the house, and then I supported her the rest of her life. Uh, and she, in turn, had a life estate. Mm -hmm. Good. So that she, and then 
we had worked out the funds so that whatever I had given her were put away so she could leave them to whoever she wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, and if she needed a nursing home, she could go to one if we found it necessary. But she was a very timid woman, a very sweet woman, nothing like her niece. <laughs> uh, a very sweet, gentle woman. Oh, you're a sweet woman. No, oh, I don't, don't, don't fool yourself. Oh, no. Oh, uh, no. She was a very gentle woman, and she was very afraid of people and places and strangeness. And she asked, begged me not to ever put her in a hospital or a nursing home. And fortunately, I was able to keep my word. Oh, good. I made a vow, and I promised I would let her stay here. And, and she died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Uh -huh. So I kept my vow, which was nice. I didn't know what I was going to be able to. And we now had the house here. We had the big house back in New Jersey. We had a condo in North Carolina. And at the time she took bad on us and sick, we were buying a house in Florida. So I looked at Randy and said, you know what, dear? I think we better pull in our horns a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we had had some health problems with Randy and uh, I had been told I had to retire. I wasn't ready to retire in any way, shape, or form. But I had been told I had to. And Randy had already been retired from, oh, well, let's see, you had already been retired 10 years. Yeah, because you're retired now 20 years when you were MS. So uh, I said, you know, I think we better not sign the contracts in Florida. And we better go home and regroup because I've got to get out to, I had to get to help in here. I, I couldn't leave her alone. And I was very fortunate. The Senior Citizens Council here is wonderful. And the gal that runs it got me a um, very lovely lady from Jamaica to come live in. Because I still had the business at this point. And uh, she came and stayed here with her. And uh, she stayed 20, I mean, she just she moved in. And then the last two weeks, we had to have two women come in to, to mm -hmm. manage. But we were able to, they were able to handle it, and they got me the help. And then we came back from Florida in a hurry and came here, and I had to get things that had to be taken care of. And uh, that was in May, I guess, of 93. She died in August of 93. And then we came out here and started to renovate the house. I went ahead and planned on moving here. And Randy swore she wasn't coming. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? She said this was the end of the world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Randy likes shopping and malls and mm -hmm. all the excitement mm -hmm. of people around. Mm -hmm. and then it's kind of funny when you think about it, because Randy was born in a small town. And I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I love it here, <laughs> and I wouldn't give you two cents for the city, and I wouldn't go into the city if I, somebody forced me to. And Randy loves the city, so she, uh, she found it a bit of adjustment. Every time we had an argument, she said, I'm leaving. And I said, good, pack your bag. <laughs> pack your bag. But make sure you take all your collectibles with you. When did you become aware of the women's community out here, or was there a com women's community? Yes, there was. Well, we yes. had heard about Ego first, mm. uh, and went over there and went to a few things, and uh, didn't think we belonged with that group. And they don't want to say anything further. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we said, well, I guess we're going to just keep in touch and have our friends come out and visit us, which we were having, you know, people were coming at that mm -hmm. point. We were all young enough to travel. They were terrific young enough to travel out here. Uh, and then we went to Trimble's, the nursery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I picked up on Hannah, Nancy. the scene and said uh, to Nancy, I think it was, it was more friendly and talking to her and mm. said, uh, we're looking for some people to do some work because we needed some electrical work and we needed some other things. And I said, do you anybody that would be compatible? <laughs> and she said, well, we have gals that do work. So it was Annabelle Keeley. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Dar 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 Annabelle. Annabelle. And, Kelly. And, uh, and Kelly. Kelly. And I think Sandy was her partner at yes. the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we called and had her come out. And they, Doris worked here quite a while, did some electrical work. And, uh, and I think one job, Kelly came with her. And Doris had been talking about the group. 
And I said, well, who do I get in touch with? And I couldn't get an answer. And uh, she said, well, Kelly's on the board. Kelly will tell you. Well, Kelly was here, and I couldn't get an answer. Awesome. And then we met Ellen at the cat store. In the meantime, we had gotten Willie out here. We found Willie. And as you can see, whatever Willie wanted, Willie gets. <laughs> so down we go to the pet store to buy toys for Willie. Yeah. And um, Ellen and, got, and I got to talking, and I said to Ellen one day, I said, you know, I said, what the hell is this, a big secret? I can't find anybody to talk to. I said, uh, who do I get in touch with? She said, well, I'll give you Janet Swanson's number. And I said, well, it'd be nice if somebody would give me a number, you know, where I could reach somebody. So we called Janet Swanson, and she was very gracious. We talked on the phone for about a half hour. And it was right just before New Year's. I think that's the first time we met you. I think so, yes. Uh, she invited us to her New Year's party. Mm -hmm. She said, as new people, she said, maybe I'll give you a chance to meet some people. And you were parking cars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's right. My yeah, perennial job. Good memories. <laughs> <from all days. laughs> so I did that at Nufwuf a lot, too. So I sort of got to be my thing for a few years there. So uh, <coughs> we... Uh, we went to that, we met Ginny Martin, and we met a couple of other people, and then slowly we started to meet people. And then I went on to a few of the committees, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Lucy Goodman was uh, president at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. And when I got out of high school, I was supposed to go to Penn State. And uh, I wouldn't go because you had to wear couldn't wear slacks. I had to wear a skirt. <laughs> they made you wear a skirt at, at Penn State? Yeah, in those mm -hmm. days. They in those days, you oh, could, you could, you had a dress code. Yeah. Yeah. You had in to those days, it was a code yeah. for everything. There's Absolutely. no codes left anymore. Absolutely. You'd be oh, home nice. by 10 o'clock, you had to wear a skirt to all classes. I used to mm -hmm. skip Saturday classes in the 60s, early 60s. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not going there. I'm going to New York. I think if it was 60s, it was bad. You should have seen it in the 40s and 50s, but we went through it. I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. I just... Yeah, Randy. Randy had a problem with getting. I think I've seen her in a dress about four times in thirty-three years, and that was only because we had to practically knock her down and track her. <laughs> her like her retirement from the company, you know, the twenty-five year retirement. Which company did you retire from? Gordon's Gin. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you do there? Well, let's see. I started out on the line as everybody does. Then I was a uh, strip stamp operator. Uh -huh. And then I went to uh, hmm, label machine. Uh -huh. And uh, then I retired. Yeah, do you get a lifetime supply of Gort Gordon's gin in your retirement <laughs> No, package? I'm afraid not. <laughs> oh, you couldn't even sneak it by a lot of those. Some of the girls had some clever ways of doing it. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> Strapped to the inside of their thighs. Or, you know. <laughs> Little flat bottles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice flat <laughs> bottles. <laughs> we used to take a bottle off the line and stick it over in the uh, air conditioning. Uh-huh. And it would keep, stay cold yeah. that way. Uh-huh. Just open it up and have a drink. <laughs> you couldn't get a lot of bottles that were rejects, right? You couldn't take no, those no, out. No, there were no, no rejects. No there. rejects. <laughs> no. So, so then, what do you see as your future? You're going to stay here? You going to retire to uh, move to Florida or just stay? Randy had a way. I guess would be in Florida, but I have a breathing problem, so uh -huh. Florida is not. Workable for me. The heat, the mm. heat, yeah. yeah. And she has a walking problem, so here in the winter time is not workable mm. for her. Mm. But uh, but you have how I'm the one that goes out doing most of the running around. I guess we have to choose here. Oh, that looks like it. Yeah. And the and the deer, the, you're feeding the deer. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. There were a bunch of them out back this morning. Were they? Oh, they must be happy. It's warmer. Oh no, they don't. She mind. Mind. Yeah. Mind How yeah. many are out there now? I'll go take a look. She's had as many as 20 in the mm -hmm. winter time. Really. Yeah, she has her own little private herd. Randy is an animal lover, more so than a people lover. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. anything that needs feeding, we buy peanuts and we buy bird seed mm -hmm. and we buy um, deer, well, we don't buy deer food because that's illegal. We buy horse feed. We just happen to give it to the deer. <laughs> it's uh, illegal? Yeah. On Shelter Island? Uh, it's illegal in the state, I understand. I go to Agway every week and buy what they're now calling wild game food. They used to call it deer food. They call it wild game food oh, really? now. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's that's like a molasses why. and corn and oats mixed up. Mm -hmm. and dump it on the Supposedly it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Every time I get mad at her when they tromp up my garden, I tell her I'm going to report her. And she <laughs> says, I said, hey, what are you going to do when they take you away? She says, I'll go to jail because I'm gonna, not going to stop doing it. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, and we buy peanuts, and we buy suet cakes. I think half your pension check goes for your deer and your animals, doesn't it? I think so. I think so, too. Good use. Uh, she also um, collects uh, uh, tapes. The, the, uh, the, music the word tapes. collect is not enough. <laughs> Randy collects a lot of things. Randy collects miniatures and animal figurines. She's a stamp collector for 40 oh, yes. or 50 years. She's supposed to have a very extensive stamp collection. To say the least. Uh, she has a fantastic Are you still working collection. on it? You work on it every week or every... No, no. I, I buy new stamps and make them out, but uh, no, I don't work no, on it. No, she leaves it stamps until it gets in a mess and then we have to spend months working on it. Oh, dear. <laughs> I have a stamp collection. Do you? Yeah, my mother's father was a postmaster in, in northern New York, so oh, I have yeah. all the like the canal yeah, exposition. You'd probably so enjoy forth. it then. Um, Come some afternoon and spend some time with Randy Looking. You're more good. than welcome. Do you she have has U.S. commemorative mints. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Any foreign? Does she collect foreign no, stamps? No, no. Just only U.S. Yeah, just U.S. We're both. And don't you have a coin collection too? No. No, Randy has some coins. Oh, I thought you had a coin collection. No, I'm, I'm a book reader. <laughs> That's my collections. I can read. Uh, but uh, no, Randy, Randy's the collector. Yeah, go take a look at the stamps out there. Well, when we're through, on the, maybe on the table? Lucy could take a quick look. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. If you know anybody that's looking to buy any U.S. commemoratives, we have a lot of extras. Probably eBay is your best. best well, I've been trying to get on. Uh, I find eBay. I can't quite cope with it. I, I'm not crazy about it. But there's uh, this new new one come on, Stamp to Go. I just found the other last week, and I'm trying to see what I can do with that. Oh, good. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, no, Randy, uh, Randy loves her, her collections. Good. Well, thank you both very much for spending this, this afternoon with us. This is really mm -hmm. wonderful. I and might I say one thing, if I can, if we still have a minute. Sure. I know you are looking toward the being gay aspect of this, but I think that we both feel, and I'm sure Randy will disagree with me, uh, and I know I feel very strong about it. the things that I went through in the, getting my career and the discrimination I went through in my career, uh, I think was more geared to the fact that I was a woman. Uh, and everything I've done in my life uh, I didn't do as a gay woman. I did it as a woman who happened to be gay. And I think a lot of young people should know that. Uh, you don't have to wear a banner. You can achieve your goals if you're willing to pay the price. It's not easy. Uh, but you're going to be discriminated against as a woman. The other doesn't have a sign unless you make it a sign. And I think that's important for the young people. They seem to be making an awful sign today. Uh, we watched something the other night, the L word. The L word, yeah. Well, I'd like you to give them your impression of the program. It stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be the end of our conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Gee, I got through this without cussing, too.